Hello, and an official welcome to this Deakin University alumni end of year virtual event for the Faculty of Arts and Education. Sam Johnston here from the Deakin Alumni Engagement Team. It's great to have you with us. As we gather for this event, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place. And in doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we do our business this evening. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands we work and live on and, our and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. This evening, we're looking forward to reflecting on 2020 with you and with the faculty and university representatives who will speak to you shortly. You'll be hearing a faculty update from Executive Dean, Professor Christine Yu, as well as special presentations from some of our faculty academics, including three Deakin alumni. Our presenters will then join a panel discussion and you'll be able to submit questions throughout that discussion via the Q&A box on your screen. Now we're going to hear a message from Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Martin, and I hope you all enjoy it. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to be able to address Deakin's faculty alumni. This evening, I'd like to give you an update on Deakin's major achievements over the year so far, and our responses to the incredible challenges we have faced. I also want to spend some time describing our future plans in this very changed world. Over the last few months, we've been drafting Deakin's next 10 year strategy, and I'd like to share with you where we plan to focus our efforts to ensure Deakin's continued success. Deacon's alumni, supporters and friends are absolutely vital to that future success. You help us make a difference in the lives and careers of so many. Firstly, I'd like to reiterate my sincere thanks to all who supported the Student Emergency Assistance Fund, including so many alumni and colleagues. We are inspired and heartened by the many who have made contributions, which have benefited hundreds and hundreds of students during this extraordinarily challenging year. On behalf of the university, personally, and all the students, thank you. The challenges faced by many of our international students have been significant. In the first few weeks of the pandemic, as borders were closing and their casual and part-time jobs were disappearing, we responded quickly to their needs, providing financial support and ensuring they could communicate easily with us so that we could provide additional arrangements for their education and living. We continue to support all our students. They're such an important part of our Deakin community and our local, regional and Victorian communities. We'll be reaching out to alumni and friends in the next few weeks, and we hope you will continue to help our students through this challenging and ultimately formative time in their lives. Without question, this year has been extremely challenging for the sector and for Deakin. We've undergone one of our greatest ever upheavals and personally, I hope it is the greatest ever upheaval I have to experience. We know that there is still a huge amount of uncertainty and challenges to overcome, but as we leave 2020 and enter 2021, I have an overwhelming sense of optimism about the importance of universities in the recovery of Victoria and Australia. Both the federal and Victorian governments have made further commitments of support to the sector and have publicly recognised the importance of universities in the social and economic recovery of Australia in the months and years ahead. We're working closely with the state and federal governments on this roadmap and Deakin's contributions to the recovery will be expressed in our new strategy, which I'll talk to later. Our outstanding digital capability has served us so well this year and the transition to almost a completely online university has been a very successful one. This is absolutely a direct result of the talent and hard work of our academics and professional staff working in partnership with our students. We've seen resilience across all of these communities. Despite all of the challenges, our student enrollment numbers remain strong, higher than at this time last year, and indeed up 4% overall. This has been driven by domestic enrollments, which are up around 8%, buoyed by higher demand given the challenging employment market but also a strong contribution from the government subsidised short courses, mainly focused on postgraduate coursework. However, international student numbers and the stories of our international students are a different story, of course. For this year, we're down 7% overall, but importantly, new commences are down by 28% and we expect this to fall further. 
Despite this, we're working hard with our international networks, particularly in India and Indonesia, on study models that begin courses offshore, then transition to on-campus as the travel restrictions hopefully ease through the later parts of 2021. We're now the largest educator of Australian domestic students in the country, having overtaken Monash in this respect. But, and very importantly, this has not come at the expense of student experience. We retained our number one rating in Victoria for overall student experience for the fourth year in a row, making 10 years in a row if you include the previous measurement system. Indeed, we are the leading Australian public university in this regard. Deakin cannot function on its own, and this year has seen some new partnerships and endeavours. We're working on the hydrogen economy, and we've established our high cell advisory board to maximise hydrogen research and development, help to leverage investment and grow collaboration as the demand driven hydrogen economy continues to play an important part in Australia's future. Internationally, we've established a partnership between Deakin Co and Tata Management Training Centre in India, delivering blended education programs for organisations that will have unique needs post COVID. We're now casting our ambitions for the next decade in the form of our new strategic plan. The plan will deliver a sharper focus on how we add value to our students and our local, national and international communities. It will be embedded in two core activities of education and employability and research and innovation. Our education will focus on course offerings that support students at all stages of, those career, of their careers. It will integrate career thinking and employability skills into almost all of our programs. We'll focus on high quality short programs that can be built into formal qualifications and make sure that we deliver distinctive blended student experiences using the best of digital and physical campuses across all of our sites. Alongside our education, our research and innovation will see further strengthening of our already strong mutually beneficial partnerships with industry, government and the community. We'll continue to grow our innovation ecosystem with local and international partners, and in doing so, strengthen international engagement and facilitate longer term local and international collaboration. The academic impact we create from our research is important, but so is the direct benefits that come from it. We'll see greater generation of new products and services, greater influence and in improving of social policies and working on community frameworks. Our strategy has included in it five key impact themes. We're gonna build our strengths around these themes. These have been chosen because they're both important to society and relate to our strengths in education and research. They're gonna help us focus our resources and activities to ensure that we're delivering the greatest positive impact we can. These things are, firstly, advancing society, culture, and the economy. Secondly, building safe and secure communities. Thirdly, creating smarter technologies. Fourthly, enabling a sustainable world. And finally, and by no means least, improving health and well-being. Alongside these themes, we want to see ourselves being a leader in the use of digital technology. Our investment in digital increased greatly with our Live the Future strategic plan in 2011. And this commitment will only be strengthened in our new strategy. We will aim to seamlessly blend online and on-campus activities across all that we do. We'll make sure that our cybersecurity is robust and we protect the privacy of our people and partners. And above all, we'll focus on the ethical use and innovation that genuinely adds value to individuals, students, and the wider community. For the Faculty of Arts and Education, 2020 has, like the rest of the university, been a challenging year. We've seen challenges with employment, challenges around uh, how we pivot to online modes of operating for some areas, particularly related to events and shows. Teachers across the country have had to grapple with a sudden shift to online learning, and this has required incredible energy and expertise. I would like to call out particularly those who've worked across the faculty in coordinating student teacher placements. We know that we cannot function well as a society without a strong commitment to arts and education. And within the university, we, re we value this area extremely highly. The areas of work, study, research and innovation are fundamental to an inclusive, diverse and harmonious society. 
In our new strategy, we've emphasized both creativity and innovation. This is one of Deakin's greatest strengths and a major reason why our arts and education faculties are so highly rated in world rankings. In August, Deakin appointed Professor Vanessa Lem as Executive Dean and Vanessa will join us early in 2021. And we're greatly looking forward to Professor Lem's leadership and vision. I do, however, want to call out Professor Christine Yeo, who's been acting in the role of Executive Dean and has provided wonderful leadership throughout this extremely challenging year, and who will, in a few minutes, give you a detailed overview of the year in the faculty. Thank you very much to Vice Chancellor Professor Ian Martin for that message. In a moment, I'll hand over to Executive Dean Professor Christine Yeo for a faculty update and then to introduce our other guest speakers and moderate the Q&A after those presentations. A reminder for our audience to please use the Q&A box to submit questions throughout the presentations and during that discussion. And for those streaming via Facebook, please use the comments box. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the end. And now, for the faculty update. Over to you, Professor Christine Yeo. Thank you, Sam, and hello to you all. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration for the Faculty of Arts and Education. And I hope you have managed to navigate 2020 well and still have a sense of optimism. If you could show the next slide, please. The Faculty of Arts and Education is here to ensure arts, humanities and education are able to contribute to research and development that impacts the well-being of communities. We've just completed the consultation on our new faculty strategic plan entitled Creative and Critical to take us through to 2025 and beyond. Our plan confirms our support for recognising the power of human capabilities and their role in the economic, social, cultural and environmental well-being of our communities. The next slide, please. 2020 has been a year of challenge, particularly for delivery of our courses and keeping our students on track. To give you examples of the ways in which the faculty responded to these challenges, in January, when international students were unable to return to their on-campus studies, our teaching teams swung into action to ensure these students could complete their studies and assessments online and in their home country. In March, as the pandemic hit Victoria, all our on-campus studies were converted into cloud delivery mode within one week. Staff adjusted 476 units in trimester one and a further 438 in tri two. These adjustments have included some very difficult issues, such as providing classes to students in remote communities and supporting practical teaching classes and other applied studies. Now, next slide. A good example of the type of work our teams engaged in to support our students comes from our Centre of Humanitarian Leadership. The Centre, provides a graduate certificate in humanitarian leadership to people working in refugee camps and other humanitarian support programs around the world. One unit involves management of a simulated disaster situation and normally it's conducted on site in a venue such as in Indonesia. With COVID, this program was conducted online. So with students loca located around the world, a lead team of academics in Melbourne worked across time zones with a series of learning coaches to analyze reports and updates on an unfolding disaster in an imaginary country, Lolisia. Students were required to respond and manage the humanitarian impact as though real. Academic staff dressed up and acted out live roles of reporters, members of agencies and victims to create a realistic scenario for the students to manage. This was a major undertaking and has been very well received by students. Our solutions to learning online are creative, engaging and realistic, and they create authentic learning and assessment opportunities in close association with industry partners. And despite online delivery, our students in 2020 have reported higher levels of satisfaction in their studies than in previous years. The next slide, please. 
In like manner, our researchers have delivered a very positive outcome in the face of the challenges of 2020. Our researchers kept teams, partners and communities connected through online workshops, seminars and webinars. And a measure of the success of our researchers is evident in this slide, summarising achievements recorded in just the past two weeks. It has been a year of challenge, but one in which we have succeeded through the combined strengths of our digital capacity, commitment to our strong teams and strong partnerships with many communities and agencies. Our next slide, please. So great partnerships underpin our university. And this year, we were delighted to partner with inspiring donors to secure significant philanthropic gifts that will support increased excellence and opportunity for the faculty and strengthen Deacon's commitment to be a catalyst for positive change to the benefit of our students, staff, alumni and communities. And I'm proud to share this story of the Judy Hill Scholarship, which was established by Jenny Hill in memory of her mother. Jenny's gift of $100,000 is, is for a scholarship to assist mature women studying teaching or nursing to overcome the barriers they face in reaching higher education. I want to offer my heartfelt thanks for this generosity and I'm so pleased our generous visionary supporters are joining us in serving our students and communities. And I'd also like to say thank you to each and every one of you who has made a contribution to Deakin in some way this year. As we look towards Deakin's next decade, much remains to be done to continue to realise our aspiration to be Australia's most progressive university. And we know we can increase the difference we make on people's lives when we do this in partnership with people who care about our future and that of the communities we serve. So if you'd like to get in touch to discuss how you can make a positive impact, please contact us after this webinar. And our next slide, please join me in acknowledging our two 2020 Deakin Alumni Award winners from the faculty who were announced in the online ceremony held 8th of October. Firstly, Megan Gilmore, who studied the Master of International and Community Development in 2013. And after her son was seriously ill, Megan saw firsthand that children with serious illness were being left out of classroom life and isolated from school. She now empowers these children through her organisation that places robots in schools so they can have a presence in the classroom and are included. Through research and practice, she advocates for change for these children and now informs the efforts of educators, health providers and governments. And Amenthi Yasinge, who studied the Graduate Certificate of Humanitarian Leadership in 2015, a humanita humanitarian aid worker who has headed World Vision, Sri Lanka's humanitarian and emergency affairs team. And Amenthi has worked with World Vision in Mozambique, Nepal, South Sudan, and Plan International in Sri Lanka, and Motivation Charitable Trust based out of UK. She is now a consultant with extensive international development and humanitarian program experience, specialising in disaster management and grant acquisitions. We celebrate these wonderful alumni. So now we're going to move to our panel members and we're going to spend the next 30 minutes hearing from them about their highlights of the past year how they've adapted to the disruptions and challenges of 2020 and their views on the directions of the future partnerships with the faculty. After these presentations, we'll be opening up to audience questions and we would love to hear from you. So as we go along, please remember to submit any questions you have for our panel through the Q&A box on your screen and we'll get to as many as we can over the course of the conversation. So our first speaker is Dr. Billy Griffiths, lecturer from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Welcome, Billy. Thank you, Christine. And, uh, and thank you, Sam, for your acknowledgement of country earlier. I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri country today. And as a historian, I, think I thought I'd use this moment to reflect on how the challenges of 2020 have disrupted Australians' historical imagination. My year began on Ewan country, on the New South Wales South Coast, 
in the thick haze of the fires. We felt rel relatively safe where we were, despite the blanket of smoke. The Karawan blaze had passed through a month earlier, leaving little left to, to burn. But we were not safe, of course, as so many Australians learned this fire season. There was nothing predictable about the fires that raged from winter into spring, into summer, smouldering into autumn. Not only was fire reaching into ecologies unfamiliar with flame, but it was looping back on itself, with fallen leaf litter fueling new spot fires. This was a new breed of fire, a biome pushed to its limits by anthropogenic climate change. I later read how the smoke from the New Year's fires had carried east across the seas to choke cities in New Zealand, and after circumnavigating the globe, bruised the skies of Perth. We evacuated the region in the early hours of the 2nd of January, seizing on a narrow window when the roads, roads were clear, following a police escort through a corridor of still burning bush. Fallen power lines smouldered on the roadside, paint had melted off the signs, blackened gum leaves fluttered from the lurid orange sky. The smoke stayed with us all the way back to Melbourne and the fug of tragedy was just as thick. Some of our colleagues here at Deakin lost family in these fires. Others lost houses. We all lost places we love. For First Nations peoples, this sense of loss is acute. And in mid-January, across Steakins campuses, Aboriginal flags were lowered to half-mast in mourning for the destruction of country with all its complex meanings and associations. As Gabby Fletcher, the director of the Nikiri Institute wrote, to lose country in this way, in this way is a distinct, messy kind of grief. This year, Deakin scholars, including one of my master's students, had been partnering with Indigenous fire practitioners and ecologists to understand past fire practices and to better prepare ourselves for the summers that lie ahead. We are still learning to live with fire on this continent. I'll move on to the next slide, please. As the novel coronavirus consumed the bushfire crisis, and here at Deakin we moved our classes online, our colleagues and students again searched the past for insights into the present. We looked to the pneumonic influenza pandemic, which spread throughout the world in 1918-19, prompting widespread usage of masks. And then we looked even earlier to the role of disease in the conquest of Australia. I wonder how the COVID-19 pandemic will shift Australians' understanding of the years following British arrival? Will it help us appreciate, with the full depth of compassion, the enormity of the smallpox epidemics in the 18th and 19th centuries? Disease killed some 80 to 90% of the population in parts of Eastern Australia. And let's be clear, this was and remains the single greatest demographic catastrophe in Australian history. The, 19, the 1789 smallpox epidemic is particularly vivid in the historical sources. The new pathogen known to Eora and Daragas, Galgala, engulfed the societies of Sydney 15 months after the British landed. It ripped through densely populated areas, areas provoking terror and disbelief. There was no cure. It has extinguished entire language groups, killed warriors in the midst of resistance and disproportionately affected elders, stealing cultural knowledge as well as lives and it traveled far ahead of the frontier. So that when European explorers eventually moved inland, they were greeted by the pockmarked faces of survivors. In Australia, disease is often invoked to qualify the culpability of the invaders. Part of the great Australian silence has been a willingness to see disease as inevitable and apolitical. But during this pandemic, we have witnessed every country in the world confront the same biological phenomenon with dramatically different consequences. The global story we are watching unfold is not only about microbes, it is also about culture, politics, and history. There is nothing inevitable about the spread of disease. And these are the questions that we ask and continue to ask in the School of the Humanities and Social Sciences. I think I'll leave it there, thank you. Hello. Um, hello, listeners. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Billy. That was great. Thank you, Miles. 
<laughs> I'll jump straight in. You jump. Uh, brilliant. Um, well, as you can see from my slide here, there's an image of skydivers and a quote from my favourite country singer, Guy Clark. Life is just a leap of faith. Spread your arms, hold your breath and always trust your cape. The image of the skydivers has nothing to do with me or my work at Deakin. It's just a stock image that PowerPoint suggested I use when I typed the quote in. But it's very fitting to teaching online in 2020. The leaping, the falling, the terror, throw some exhaustion, sore eyes and some praying that it will soon be over and getting pretty close to the sense of the experience. Without wanting to sound like a motivational speaker, now that I've done a lot of online teaching and to stick with the skydiving analogy, the shoots open and hopefully I'm getting a little bit closer to land. Hopefully we all are, at least for the end of 2020. And I feel a real sense of quiet triumph, a bit of joy and a sense of relief at what, according to student feedback was, despite COVID, a really fun and successful year of learning. I, like so many of us this year, faced a scary, many scary disruptions. But for me, trusting the Guy Clark cape and leaping forth, I felt really happy with the lessons that both taught and the lessons I learned myself on the way down in 2020. Next slide, please, Sam. As a theatre maker, I'm no stranger to disruptions. I learned this leap of faith approach when I was a student at Deakin studying drama in the early 2000s. While I was a student, I started a theatre company called The Suitcase Royale. This is not a stock image. That's me with more hair on my head and less on my face and two other Deakin alumni, Glenn Walton and Joseph O'Farrell. We started the theatre company in our final year at Deakin and this company had great and quick success, including being programmed in the 2005 International Melbourne Festival less than a year after we graduated. Our quick success was due in no small part to the training we received from the staff at Deakin. When I was a student at Deakin, uh, the drama lecturers and technical staff showed me how to be fearless, how to leap off and work out the details on the way down. At times, this approach causes disruptions, but I've learned that disruptions can be the greatest, greatest teachers. The disruptions I've experienced while making and performing theatre have taught me to be brave and generous and to be a great collaborator and performer, to laugh at myself and to walk lightly, to innovate and to be lateral. Theatre happens live in the moment and often requires you to change tact on the spot. For example, if an actor forgets a line or if the lighting cue fails, if an audience member's phone goes off in the middle of your scene, you have to adapt. A career dealing with these many small and minor disruptions trained me to be able to deal with bigger disruptions quickly. New slide, please, Sam. Uh, the suitcase rail even began to embrace these disruptions as a deliberate live aesthetic, making the forgetting of lines, the sets and the props breaking and the seeming technical faults all part of the live show. We felt these disruptions made the moment of performance, being in the room with the audience, more live, more fun and more playful. And as this review of our season in the, at the Sydney Theatre Company demonstrates, this playful skill set, seated at Deakin and honed in the industry, has enabled me to jump off and work things out on the way down just like my skydiving buddies. Next slide, please, Sam. So that's what I did when we pivoted to online at Deakin. I asked myself, what was that main lesson that I needed to teach students if everything was going to hell, if we were jumping online? What did I need to pass on so they could go forward? And what I carried with me, what did I carry with me as a student when I was Deakin? Uh, it's what I learned from teachers and it's now what I'm past, tasked with passing on despite any disruption. Next slide, please, Sam. Uh, this is a still from a second year drama unit that I taught on Zoom this year. The unit teaches group work, how to make theatre as part of an ensemble. But more than anything, the unit's about teaching students to collaborate generously and creatively. It's a key unit in passing on skills students need to make theatre. I've taught this in the past on campus and I was really worried about how we could transfer it online. As I've said, performing theatre is about being in the moment, but really the making part of it, the part I teach people how to do at Deakin, is more than anything about learning to play, to harness and to value the childlike spirit of lateral thinking, of bold creativity and the free flow of ideas. And kids can play anywhere, online, sandpit whatever. New slide, please, Sam. 
Uh, this is one of the 150 or so students I taught the value of play to this year, um, playing freely and boldly in his bedroom at his parents' house in the final part of his final performance in the second year unit. As I do when I teach on campus, I made these students work really hard. They were sweating and laughing as I trained them through fast paced and fun physical practice, which taught them to playfully embrace the creative possibilities of their bedroom, if not the campus drama rooms. Uh, and the new possibilities that performing theatre on Zoom can offer. Last slide, please, Sam. These students were spread far and wide, 25 separate bedrooms in this class, working in share houses in different countries, family houses, tiny apartments during isolation. But the lessons were the same as they are on campus, as they are online. The same lessons I'd learned at Deakin when I was a student. Be bold, work hard, first thought, best thought collaborate generously, hold on tightly, let go lightly, or in one word, play. Theatre, art, art making more broadly has gone through a tectonic shift this year. But art's always changing. Everything's always changing. And I think that sense of play was crucial to me as a Deacon student. And so it's crucial that I pass it on to the artists of tomorrow. As Guy Clark says, close your eyes, hold your breath and always trust your cape. That spirit has certainly served me and my students well as we learn to play remotely while free falling through an entirely new field of teaching, learning and making theatre in 2020. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thank you and good evening to all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and share some information about international education and international students experience. The topics that are very close to my heart as an international student myself just a year ago. The next slide, the next slide please. Thank you. The, the next one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So international education is Australia's third largest export. And besides the economic benefits, the sector contributed enormously to Australia's culture and society. International students brings the diversity that supports the internationalization of the learning experience and the outlooks of Australian local students. They contribute to enhancing partnerships for social progress and be part of the workforce in essential um, services. Needless to say, the COVID-19 pandemic is an extraordinary situation that has tremendous and in many ways detrimental impact on international education. Um, we see headlines about slashed revenues, job losses, decline in international student number and uncertain future. Um, we also see empty campuses as university move to online learning and with the absence of international students, campuses become less cosmopolitan, at least in a while. Can you move to the next animation? Yeah, the next one. Thank you, Sang. Yeah. Um, during the crisis, international students have been one of the most vulnerable groups, unlike local students, international students couldn't return home and they face anxiety about health, their own health and that of their loved one back home, the lack of accommodation and support, financial stress, future uncertainty, lost hope and dream, and even discrimination and verbal assaults against Asians. To make it worse, international students are excluded from the federal government subsidies, the job seekers and coronavirus supplement. Um, however, on a positive note, as uh, Professor Ian Martin updated at the beginning of the webinar, there have been remarkable support for international students from the state governments uh, institution and community organization, um, ranging from financial hardship grants, fee refund and deferral, academic and well-being support to free meals and groceries. On various international students' forum, 
Um, there have been wonderful mutual support um, yeah, among international students, which showcase the incredible resilience and individual collective agency to act in turbulent times. Um, that being said, I do think that uh, university counseling services is um, critical and it's important that they proactively reach out to international students to help them with mental health problems um, because many of international students will tend to shy away speaking to the professional. Timely information um, hotlines or support groups in different languages and with student involvement are also important. To be mindful of time, I'd like to conclude here with uh, a hopeful tone. So can you move on to the next slide, Sam? Thank you. So over, the, over this year, we have learned to live with changes and with the unknown, um, which definitely help build one's character and resilience. Unlike the US and the UK, Australia is still a safer choice for international students and their nervous parents. We don't know when mobility will become reality for students again, but in the meantime, um, this pandemic has given us the opportunity to let go of old habits and to make space for new ones. For international education um, post-COVID, online learning may remain commonplace besides mobility and face-to-face -face learning, and this will present more equitable opportunities for knowledge and cultural exchange for all students, rather than a small pro proportion of students who can afford international mobility and the cultural and language diversity of staff and students on campus or in the local and global communities will become the great resources for developing all students global citizenship, which is an important um, learning graduate learning outcome of Deakin and many others Australian universities. So that is the, the end of my presentation. Thank you. All right, Kaya. I'm Kitty, proud Noongar and Tufada Toa woman. Uh, I am a Deakin alumnus and also partnerships coordinator at Makiri Institute. Um, so I would also like to acknowledge that I'm living and working on Wadawurrung country. So 2020, a big year for all of our Deakin community uh, and everyone. Nikiri started the year as the Institute of Career Education, or IKE, um, and in March we held our launch event. So we were already looking to the future. Nikiri built on the 30 plus year legacy of IKE, honoring its past and continues to grow and be enriched by local insight and knowledges. In that 36 years, we've graduated over a thousand students, uh, beginning as Deacon and Bachelor of Teaching and Education, so DBATE in 1986, uh, then the Curry Teacher Education Program, or KTEP, uh, and that then involved, uh, evolved into the Institute of Curry Education, or IKE, as we've been known for many years. So the rebrand brand uh, reflected the growing capabilities and ambition of the Institute, uh, and Nikiri is emblematic of this expansion. So we needed to have a name that represented our national footprint and to highlight all of the amazing things that we actually do here. So welcome the National Indigenous Knowledges Education Research Innovation Institute, hence uh, shortening it to Nikiri. So I'm extremely grateful that we had this launch when we did. Uh, it involved a lot of our internal partnerships and um, community partnerships. Uh, and it was a really great coming together. Uh, there was already whispers of COVID and we basically had sent our students home um, and were working from home within about a week of that launch. So really grateful that we got to sort of have that one last um, get together. For those unaware, Nikiri Institute offers student services support across all of Deakin for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, when it comes to students specifically enrolled in Nikiri, we offer what is called community-based delivery or CBD. So this means our students um, are mixed mode. 
So they get to uh, live and work within their communities and keep their community commitments. Um, and then we bring them in to stay in our Kajara residences for in intensives. So it's one or two weeks per trimester, depending on their course. So as I'm speaking about uh, Nikiri as a whole, I wanted to chat with some of our lecturers and gather some insights on student learning specifically and the, the challenges of transposing Indigenous pedagogy to a digital environment. So there are many components to Indigenous teaching practices, but key is the creation of a respectful space for people to interact um, and contribute to their own learning and the learning of others. So one example of this has been the use of digital yarning circles. Um, and so this, this is a way that we can share knowledge. You know, it's not just the lecturer um, sort of teaching and, and, and sharing, it's, it's all of us sharing our lived experiences. Um, so in addition, our digital classrooms have provided the opportunity for more of our community members to join in the class. For example, many students worked and studied at home alongside their children and grandchildren. So there was a natural inclusion of these younger members um, into our community and into our digital classrooms. So overall, whilst we couldn't physically connect as much as we normally would, our online classrooms emphasized our cultural protocols of connection and relationality. So in June, an even harsher disruption came for all people of color uh, and, and further out to the community, the Black Lives Matter movement. Social media became a minefield of racism and added to the disconnection that COVID had already brought. Nikiri staff and students alike felt displaced and isolated. So we needed to find connection to our communities, to our knowledges and to our country. Having spent four years prior to 2020 uh, as a Deakin Visual Arts student, I know how much art can heal and how much art can connect. So this is how the July Live Art event came about. Even though NADOC this year had officially been postponed until November, we needed to honor those original dates. A virtual event that could provide the connection we all needed. The July Live, Live Art project was a contemporary interpretation of traditional indigenous painting and oral storytelling. Uh, we actually had people from the audience um, able to chat you know, live over Zoom and they were able to tell us their story uh, and their connection to land. And then Dr. Jenny Murray-Jones and myself painted on a seven by three meter uh, mural. So we painted everyone's country within this large piece. Um, and it was just a huge success in the sense that we, we really did feel connected. And, and that was such a great event that um, we redid it in November. So we went even bigger and um, included some national partners and we live streamed out of Deacon Edge and we ended up seeing 800 views on our Nikiri Facebook page um, and had 300 registered viewers for the actual live event. So it was amazing. Uh, what an amazing celebration of First Nations culture, knowledge and storytelling. All right, next slide, please. So if 2020 had an icon, this would be it. Uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings, Zoom events, Zoom podcasts, Zoom interviews, and even Zoom panels. I'm sure like me, we will definitely be happy to be less Zoom fatigued. However, they are awesome. What a great way to connect to someone you physically cannot meet up with. Um, with Nakiri students living all over Australia, we have in some ways been able to connect more with our students uh, and more with our national partners. So we have had students able to attend more events. We've been able to establish engagements with high school students on a national scale. Um, I think that I have been able to uh, speak on more panels than I would have had I needed to be uh, physically going to these spaces. Um, and we've also been able to utilize Zoom for creating many more events because um, other than a lot of sort of innovative, creative ways of using Zoom, the budget can be pretty low. You know, you're not having to pay for a lot of extra things. So I think we've been able to connect and, and establish more events. So more ways of connecting than we would have, I guess, if things were normal. So I am a glass half full kind of person and I am really proud to have that same feel from the other panel members today. Uh, and further to that though, first, persons, first Nation people have always had to fight for our place or find perseverance and the ability to move forward. That is at the heart of Nikiri, adaptation and innovation, finding a way and we have certainly done that. 
Our students have adapted to isolated learning and they have maintained progression. We have had virtual recruitment sessions nationally and have more students enrolling for 2021. We are proud of our students' resilience and that of our staff and our community. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Lovely energy. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers for their very different perspectives on their experience of the 2020 uh, pandemic. And as our Vice Chancellor said, he hoped he never lives through another one. Sorry, I'm starting my video too. So, and as our Vice Chancellor said, he hopes he never, we never have to live through another one. Um, that may be, but um, you know, life is going to take many turns as we move on. So we're going to join our panel members now and um, we have some questions in our chat box. So thank you for the first question from Katja. And Katja says, I feel that 2020 has given many people a sense that the CAPE in Miles's terms is either not functioning or is gone. I would like to know where Billy might see our CAPE being when it comes to climate change. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Katja. And, and thank you, Miles, for that, well, and, and Guy Clark for that, that image to conjure with. I, I love, love that, that sense and, and of, uh, your evocation of, of teaching this year really resonated with my experiences. Um, when it comes to uh, the challenges we're facing this year, when it comes to climate change, I think uh, our CAPE might be seeing clearly and, and thinking critically. Uh, things that uh, arts degrees, humanities and social sciences very broadly um, uh, equip us to do, to think critically. One of the reasons we, we might feel we don't have that CAPE um, is because of all these competing truths that are out there. And, 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 and who won the election in the US? Uh, uh, is this news real? Is it fake? Um, this, there is a, a, an urgency to, to um, the, the, the 2020 discourse has given this urgency to uh, having critical thinking, to be able to decipher what, what is, um, uh, what, does, what stacks up, what doesn't stack up. And I think in order to confront a challenge like climate, the climate crisis, it will require looking, seeing clearly, and thinking critically, things which um, we train our students, teach our students to do, to think creatively as well, I would say. Thank you. And I wonder, uh, Kitty, just picking up on that theme about truth and notions, um, one of the, the points that Billy made was around sort of disease and the spread of disease. And in, the, in this year, our Indigenous communities have really managed that very differently. Yeah, well, um, I, I certainly know that when the whispers came around that, that you know, the situation was happening and that there was something happening out there, um, we were definitely one of the first to send our students home. Um, I guess having a lot of, of our community, um, like our students are from communities, rural remote communities that have, you know, these elders that we've got to keep protected. So um, it was definitely a case of that. And I think it has been a really wonderful thing seeing how much um, they have been put into an umbrella. You know, everyone was making sure that people were staying in, in remote communities. And we thought we were quite isolated here, especially those in Melbourne um, with the Ring of Steel. But we were speaking to students that hadn't been able to leave their community, you know, and it was, it was just a self-isolation because, you know, we all respected the fact that um, there is a difference in the way disease is handled. Um, you know, we've got to be sort of aware of that knowledge anyway, and just be super protective of our people. So it was really good to see that um, and see it work, dare I say. And, take, <laughs> and taking responsibility on one. Thank you. And there is a, another question, actually, Billy. Uh, this is from Trevor, and it, it's um, sort of a long question. But Billy, as a historian, the themes we've heard today, difficulties getting international students into Australia for study and their support in country, humanitarian program management, and reflecting on the international communities for COVID. Australia, while witnessing positive public health comes, outcomes, it has been a great human cost and deprivation of liberties not seen elsewhere. Um, stranded Australians overseas and travel bans chiefly among them. How do you feel that, um, sorry, that slipped. 
I've lost it. How do you feel history will judge Australia's political leadership handling the pandemic? A question. I am, um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing um, that we are not experiencing what uh, so many countries around the world are experiencing right now. And I think we have been through some particularly um, severe lockdowns um, in, uh, in Victoria, um, but wow, the fact that we can now move outside without masks um, uh, is phenomenal. Um, I think the, uh, the, the scale of the catastrophe that's unfolding elsewhere is uh, mind blowing. And we still haven't seen that um, fully uh, realize uh, itself. Uh, we're not sure where, where it's going. And also uh, the even lessons from South Australia show that we are, um, uh, it's an, an evolving situation. And, uh, and so we, uh, it's, it's very hard to, to, to be the historian from the future casting back but just to look at this moment, I mean, I, I, and just to look at our moment between the first and the second wave in Victoria as well, of, of, of breathing space and um, as, as, as an, an achievement, of, a wonderful achievement of, of, of um, collective um, cooperation and uh, an achievement which has been led, I would say, again, by First Nations peoples um, who have uh, their response to the pandemic has been coordinated often far ahead of um, uh, state and, go and federal government uh, agencies and, uh, and remarkably effective. And that is based on this historical memory, not just based on, uh, on smallpox that I alluded to, but also the mnemonic influenza and H1N1. There is a lived experience that has been carried forward um, and, uh, and, and which I think provides um, provides hope but I wonder how I to throw that out to the, to the panel if anyone would like to dare to respond. I might move just quickly on to another question if you don't mind just uh, we've got a few minutes left but a question for Huang what are some of the things that people do to help international students still in Australia to help them thrive through this time? Yeah um, all right so um, although the COVID-19 pandemic has been very challenging for international students uh, in many ways, as I presented um, before. Uh, it's very encouraging to see a lot of support for international students from the state government, institution, and community organizations. Um, the support are, um, yeah, the, the support includes the financial hardship grants, provision of um, intensive courses, fee, um, the, um, fee refund and deferral, changes of semester commencement dates or extended academic and well-being support, including the counseling helplines and coronavirus specific information and guidelines, and also supports um, um, with visa issues and um, emergency food relief or accommodation and employment. So the supports are various and it's very um, touching to see those support for international students during the time they need it the most. That's really yes. nice to hear. Uh, I mean, I'm hearing that they feel cared for, which is something I think yes. we worried about very much at the beginning, in the early stages of the pandemic that we felt our, our international students were not feeling that Australia cared for them. So that's good to hear. Yes. No, thank yes. you. I'll just do one last, we, we're really out of time, but Miles, just a quick question for you. Because of the impact on the arts, how do you think theatre makers will respond when we're able to return to in-person performance, but with COVID restrictions? Oh, hugs. It's all just going to be about hugs, Christine. I think <laughs> I think we're all hanging for a few more hugs and um, the extroverted nature of the, the actors will certainly not hold back in that department. Um, but yeah, I'll certainly be advocating for as many hugs as I can get. A good note to finish on. Thank you, Miles. I'm visiting my grandchildren that I haven't seen for a while and they ask their mother, can we hug grandma? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I think that's the sense of it. So, Sam, back to you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Christine, and thanks to you all on the panel. So um, we just really um, want to stay connected with all of our alumni. So please do um, keep us up to date with your contact information. Um, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and also follow our YouTube channel to um, keep, in, uh, keep track of the things that we're doing and also to be invited to events like this. Um, also, just a reminder that Deakin alumni and their direct families are eligible 15% off postgraduate course fees. You can find more information about this great offer at the Deakin alumni website. To watch uh, past webinar recordings like this one, um, you can visit the webinar and resources page on the Deakin alumni website or visit the YouTube page I mentioned just by searching for Deakin alumni. Um, this event is being recorded and you'll receive an email with the link for that in the coming days. Uh, thanks once again for joining us. Thank you to our fantastic panel and to everyone helping behind the scenes. Um, so please submit any feedback or questions that you still have to Deakin alumni at deakin.edu.au. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this event and please stay safe and healthy um, as we finish up this year and we look forward to staying in touch with you as we move into 2021. Thanks again and good night.